Anyway, we welcome in the Friday Five via telephone. Joe Joey Torts ready. Joseph, good morning to you. Good morning, everybody. We had the pleasure of having Joe in studio a couple of days this week as he was up in Martinsburg making sure that the staff was obeying his every order as he comes into town once every now and then to make sure he's... Make sure you know, he, he, he extended that when he came to the radio the other day. We oh, yeah. had that whip in hand, and if we stepped out of line, it snapped right over our heads. Taskmaster. Taskmaster. Some lawyers, as they go along in their career, but, but make that point get, that too. Get yeah. a little disappointed that they they don't have the ability to actually issue paper orders like judges. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Joe had a had a partner yes. Who, yes. who started doing that, and maybe Joe just felt a little left out. It's possible. So, yeah, I would say go ahead and just print the orders up, Joe. And I mean, you know, there's going to be a fair number of people who will think you are a judge. Yeah. And then, then you got the power, man. Act judicially. Yeah. Uh, in in uh, studio, Larry Schultz. You just heard the voice of uh, Larry Schultz, who, uh, when he's done with his whole law career, has a career as a voiceover artist. I hope so. Yes. Uh, anytime. Could happen. Uh, also. Do it for free now. <laughs> so. <laughs> also, Mike Carl, who has uh, he's done with his professional career, who has a future as the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals, because he knows what they should do every single game. They they're doing great, and thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> the model NL franchise, absolutely, one hundred percent. Well, gentlemen, as Memorial Day weekend uh, is upon us, it is also, uh, of course, obviously a weekend where we remember those who have served their country and their families, and it's also a big movie weekend. This is a huge weekend over the course of movie history for releases of sequels, blockbusters, and such. And as a result, I have painstakingly researched a list of the top 200 movie releases on Memorial Day weekends since movies were being released over Memorial Day weekends. And in searching these 200 movies, I have attempted to identify from each movie a character who I think you best represent and in turn best represents you. The Three Stooges, Mike. <laughs> Fortunately for everybody in this room, the Three Stooges movie was not released Memorial Day weekend. Because that would have been an easy one this week. Now, the only qualifier was the movie had to be released Memorial Day weekend. Didn't have to be Memorial Day, but during the course of the movie Memorial Day weekend. And so, without further ado. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. All right, Mr. Schultz. As we celebrate a long weekend and find a movie that's not quite great, we look down the list of the all-time best and stop at number eight. The Hangover Part 2 was released in 2011. It wasn't a bad sequel. I do this for Freddie's laugh on the telephone. I know, I know what's coming. <laughs> the Hangover Part 2 was released in 2011. It wasn't a bad sequel. Unfortunately for Larry Schultz, his bachelor party wasn't quite the equal. <laughs> so just in case you wondered just how far this comparison can take us, first, let's just have a look at Larry's new twin, Zach Galifianakis. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think, honestly, bonus points to me for being able to rhyme Zach Galifianakis. I mean, you know, yes, take that one on yourself. Touche. All right. This guy's got a rep for being a little cranky and cross. So I looked for a movie, maybe something with a boss. So I scrolled down the list of all these pretenders and skipped the movies that could have been a contender. Until I came upon this dude named Fred at the quarry all dirty and found Mike Height and the Flintstones sitting at number 30. <laughs> Honestly, I do this for myself. <clears throat> we celebrated Star Wars week and had fun we did. And on this list, Star Wars movies are five of the top 200. I'm of the belief that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And when that comes to Star Wars characters, don't mix it. So Mike Carl, as of May 26, you're still a Rhino hater. And in slot number 105, Star Wars A New Hope, you're still Darth Vader. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's the overlord staring down upon us, in intimidating all of us with his knowledge of tax law. Well, I took some serious liberties with the film in slot 46 for the benefit of those of you needing your last Baywatch fix. Imagine if you will, and I don't think this is too hard, to think of our next panelist charging through the sand as a lifeguard. 
Now open up your eyes, and I give you the ultimate to top it off. Why, it's Joe, Joey Torts Ready, as played by David Hasselhoff. <laughs> there you go, Joe. Yeah, nice. I wish. And all your glory. You can really your... order people around then, buddy. <laughs> uh, just go into your next court appearance, Joe, with that look right there. Yeah. Only Bill has seen you like that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> That's not the variety that I know. <laughs> uh, for Bill Stubblefield, I had to find a man older and rough. Someone to lead the men and not be afraid to be tough. Kind of like a trainer with an accent that's thick. Like that guy who played the penguin and later played Mick. And as I move through these intros, the plot it does thicken. And I settle on the man who made Rocky chase that chicken. And as fate would have it, I landed on the list at slot 53. And that's where I found Burgess Meredith and his ill-fated appearance in Rocky Three. I like Burgess. Good man. You know, he dies in Rocky Three, by the yeah. way. Mm. <laughs> Just want to let you know. All right, we go uh, with our leadoff hitter in issue number one, Joe. Joey Torts for ready, Joe. Yeah, the panelists should know that, that uh, I had prior approval on my picture. <laughs> <laughs> Vito right. No, Hoff. Sorry. Sorry to say that. Okay, I'm just wondering... Rob, if everyone is sinking into a depression like I am regarding our upcoming presidential election, and I know it's early, and we can talk about that because that's going to be part of the discussion, but it's pretty clear right now that we have two individuals who are, I, I think you could call them almost almost presumptive nominees in our current president and in our former president. The races seem to be shaping up that those two are going to be going head-to-head -head once again. And the thought of that is almost nauseating to a lot of voters, as recent polling showed, where by numbers of 67 and 56 percent, respondents said it would be a disaster or a setback for either one of these individuals to be elected president. The negatives on these guys are historically low in terms of presidential candidates. And I'm talking historically going back 30 years in presidential polling. And it's scratch, I just scratch my head as to how we are barreling down the track towards having this kind of choice for president. So I'm wondering, as we sit here on a Friday morning before Memorial Day weekend, I'm wondering if this is really the two individuals this country is going to produce as nominees for president. Is there a hope of any other candidate who might come to the fore and, and actually pick up the mantle and be a nominee other than these two? Or are we destined to have this Hobson's choice for president? So my question today is, is there any hope out there? Does anybody see another candidate who has a possibility of breaking through? I, uh, right now, I don't. I am not enthused about Ron DeSantis. I think he is going to be shown to be an empty suit and not ready for prime time. The other Republican candidates are polling so woefully low as to not be considered viable at the moment. And you're looking at a presumptive nominee in a Republican side who's going to have so many legal entanglements that it, it, it just boggles the mind as to how he could be and remain viable. On the, on the Democratic side, you have a sitting president who has a 35 percent approval rating, which is down at the level where George W. Bush was in the financial crisis that almost sunk this country financially. So tell me, fellas. Is there hope out there going forward? All right. Let's look for hope and start with Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, Joe, uh, you've raised uh, several points. Uh, uh, there's two things that frighten me. One is the election process itself. While we listen to these two candidates who both have long since passed prime time, and then even more frightening after the election process that we live with one of the two. And, and, the 70 percent that's unhappy with both, I think, reflects uh, at least 70 percent of the country, even larger than that. Uh, I um, uh, 
at least on the Republican side, uh, there are candidates. Whether any of them can emerge or not, I don't know. Uh, but there are candidates. On the Democratic side, there is long tradition of not challenging the, the incumbent. So that means there's no one on the wing on the Democratic side. That, to me, is, is very frightening in its own right. Uh, it gives me hope, though, that... The uh, there's a third there's an opportunity I think a realistic opportunity for a third party this no labels party I think is doing things right uh, trying to get on the ballot of every state of all 50 states uh, people will dismiss this as saying well a third party has never been successful in the past that's right they have not been Ross Perot 17 percent was probably the the best one but got absolutely no electoral votes but I think things are different now I think you articulated very 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 well this unhappiness with both parties the, the candidates for both parties is is fertile ground for something for something that we have not seen in this country before and I'm fairly optimistic we may see viable candidates as a third party this time we'll wait and see Mike Carl well I, I agree generally with a lot of the pessimism and concerns but uh, I, I have a little different slight angle on uh, Trump I, I've got concerns about Trump and I'm kind of rooting for one of his problems to materialize and take him out. But but if he if 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 they don't take him out and he's nominated and elected, I will be feel great. I mean, his because his policy initiatives and achievements when he was president were were great and they were moving in the right direction. And I you know, whatever you say about him, if he if he if he achieves that. It, acknowledgement and recognition that satisfies his ego to get reelected, then I think he will do a lot of the good things. So I'm not as pessimistic about the outcome the prospects, uh, but the, uh, the fact the Democrats have nobody in the wings. That's scary. But the things that could really blow the whole world up, of course, is some, uh, you know, some health issue that takes Biden out or a legal issue that takes Trump out and then then we would have a wild thing and this third party movement could you know could make a difference Mr. Schultz yes I um I think the only place where anything is going to change is on the Republican side and it will change if it has to uh because even though uh Eugene V Debs proved that you can run uh, for uh, the presidency uh, from a federal prison, it's got some complications, as he found out. Uh, you know, by the way, a little point of West Virginia history, he was in Moundsville federal prison uh, when he ran for president in 1912 or whenever it was. Um, if that sort of thing comes down hard on Mr. Trump and his inability to follow the simplest lawyer's advice in a traffic ticket case about keeping your mouth shut when there's no question on the table, it leads me to believe that he's he's flinging darts at the dartboard of jail and he's hitting with a fair number of them and he's got to stop that, uh, which I don't think he ever will. So the chance that he's still going to be around and viable is kind of small. So it is a good thing that they at least have some candidates lined up out there. I don't, um, I mean, I think Joe Biden uh, will surprise some people uh, with the, especially if Donald Trump is his opponent, with the strength of his performance in the next election. I don't believe these polls that say, uh, oh, well, everybody hates both of them. I'm, I'm not buying the viability of those polls. Um, and, and there seems to be more more polling and therefore less quality polling than there used to be so i'm not worried that oh you know we don't have anybody to be president i think there'll be enough people that one or two could emerge that uh will do a good job um mr desantis is probably not going to be at the top of that list for the republicans because everything he tries just seems to come off flat um, the thing with the Elon Musk the other day was just Twitter. 
yeah, that was just crazy. Um, they, they, you know, it was like watching a junior high uh, film strip, and the and the teachers knew, and they don't know how to run the machine or whatever. <laughs> it was terrible. Uh, but uh, you know, maybe he'll improve, and maybe things will change. I I don't see that as a problem on the Democratic side. Biden's going to be fine. Uh, Debs ran for president in 1912 from the federal penitentiary at Moundsville, as you said. And then to prove there was no fluke, he did it again in 1920 from the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. He got, <laughs> got nearly a million votes because he had the machine oiled and well run by then. He well, already was, had experience. It was a tough day for socialists back in 1912 to 1920. If you were an avowed socialist, you were going to do some jail time. Well, yeah. he, he got nearly a million votes, though, Yeah, in this country. Uh, Mike Height. You know, Larry talks about uh, the strength of, of Biden in a debate. I think if he remains awake, that'll be looked at as a success for him. <laughs> um, he will get destroyed in a debate. And I don't anticipate a whole lot of debates between him and, and Donald Trump, who is the presumptive nominee at this point. I think the conservatives sort of fall in generally into two camps. You have the 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 Trumpers that love everything about Trump and they're going to vote with him no matter what. And then you have the other group that like Trump policies, but don't particularly like the man. So uh, those conservatives, if if he were reelected, while we we're not real happy about it, we do like the fact that the policies are back in place and that we think the country will be back on track and improve in that regard. Um, as far as the other candidates, I don't see a viable candidate on either side at this point. And I wonder sometimes when some of these candidates get into the race, are they really running for president or are they running to be the second man on the ticket? And I think that's sometimes what they're doing is they're getting their name out there. They're getting some popularity. They're getting some some, you know, uh, talking points and then they become viable as a second person to bring votes from their particular state to the ticket. And I think that may be what's happening, uh, at least on the Republican side. You know who the, the, the number two person is going to be on the Democratic side already. So um, that, that's sort of my take on that. And I don't, I don't see anybody else getting in the race that's going to be viable, unless you have somebody like a Joe Manchin, who I think could make a difference on the Democratic side, and that that would be a big deal. Or the third party. Or, or a third party. That's where he's been talked about most, as the, 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 the I no I think labels. he'd be more successful on the Democratic ticket. I really do. I think the Democrats are looking for somebody other than Biden. Well, whoever is the vice president, if Trump is the nominee, better start studying the Constitution about how to overturn that uh, two terms limit as president uh, of the United States. <laughs> Because that's what's next. Bingo. <laughs> yeah. Bingo. Joe, final, final word gets back to you. <laughs> well, I, 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 it's interesting to me that uh, it took a little while to get to Joe Manchin in this equation because there are still rumblings about him and this no labels group who are, are actively looking for a candidate who's going to head a possible ticket. They are amassing a fair amount of money. And they are laying the groundwork to get on the ballot in the 50 states. And they're doing it with some considerable backing in terms of personalities and dollars. So I, that's not something to be dismissed easily right now. But I, I'm sure that has yet to be sorted out. But overall, I, I look at these Republican candidates and I yearn for somebody who's going to step up and, and take on Trump. I don't see it. The amateur uh, the amateur way that the other candidates are approaching this this uh, this election tells me that there's really nobody viable who's going to take Trump on. And I think Trump will be the guy, absent uh, him getting handcuffed and taken to a federal penitentiary. And, and that's to me, it's depressing because if it's Trump Biden, I, I got to tell you personally, I, I can't get enthused. I just cannot do it. I think it's going to be Trump, Biden, plus the third party. And well, the, no labels. Yep. The, the atmosphere is ripe for that, that's for it's sure. Exactly. We uh, do our 9 o'clock break here a minute late. That's okay. A telephone Joe Ferretti in studio. Mike Height, Mike Carl, Bill Stubblefield, and Larry Schultz. And Larry, it strikes me that 
If you ever shave your beard and get contact lenses, 20% of my intros are killed. <laughs> <laughs> Only 20%? <laughs> one, one of five. Well, I mean, he's, he's one of five of you. 20%. If a guy does this for as many years that I've done it, you know, I ran into somebody not too long ago said, hey, when did you grow that beard? I said, 1983. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> So you know they don't see you a lot. <laughs> right. And uh, so um, if you've done that for, for 40 years like I have now, um, there's a pretty good reason you got to think mm -hmm. underneath there. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I get, I'll get emails from somebody that say, Rob, I love your show, man. Listen to it all the time. Hey, uh, can I be a guest at 1030? That's what I'm free next week. I'm like, obviously, you don't listen to the show every day. Sure, you can come on at 1030, but it won't be with me. All right, issue number two. We go to the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Well, Rob, I've had a tough time this week coming up with issues. In fact, at the breakfast yesterday, I asked my good friend, colleague uh uh mike carl what my issue should be he said i'll give you three issue number one was is biden the worst president we've seen in our lifetime that's, that's mike's default that is every single week. <laughs> let me let me finish it then the second issue was is biden the worst president we've seen in the history of our country <laughs> the third issue was is biden the worst president since time began so <laughs> what was the what was the answer you came up with well i don't know uh, mike i appreciate your insight i appreciate the fact you're trying to help me but i think i'll go with another issue okay it was a good shot mike <laughs> Good shot. You tried, Mike. Okay. Uh, recently, we've seen uh, uh, Trump had his uh, town hall meeting on CNN. Uh, we uh, saw DeSantis make his announcement on Twitter. Uh, T Tucker Carlson is uh, probably going to Twitter for his uh, uh, very successful uh, uh, news program. Uh, the question is, what does this mean to Fox News? Where is Fox going to go? Where is Fox going to go with the with the town hall? With, with the popularity of the people, they had they had won the uh, the largest viewing audience uh, at one time. Uh, they've taken the hits. They started the hits with the uh, uh, 2020 um, election by calling Arizona what many folks thought prematurely. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got in a, a verbal warfare with a uh, uh, with Trump. Uh, they they've taken a lot of hits. But just the last two weeks, there have been three I think fairly pronounced hits. The fact that that Trump chose CNN for his first town hall meeting, the fact that DeSantis chose Twitter to make his announcement, both of those could have been on Fox News and the opt not to do that. And uh, the fact that uh, Tucker Carlson did not wait very long, uh, even though they went into Maine and tore down his uh, broadcasting studio, Fox did, uh, Tucker Carlson very quickly has come with an alternative venue or vehicle for his uh, uh his show his cnn show i mean a fox news show all right if i want an unbiased opinion on fox news i know i'm going to larry schultz <laughs> yeah. i think fox is taking a very uh tough hit and the difficulty they have is as they begin to try and remedy this tucker carlson related mess and the other stuff with Dominion voting systems and, and all of it, that while awaiting, sort of like Trump, another hammer out there from Smartmatic, they have to pick a new line to walk down. They got rid of Tucker, so they're not going to walk the Tucker line. They're going to walk a new line, and nobody knows for sure what it's going to be. As they move further away from what they used to do, Trump voters specifically will have even more contempt for them than they do now because they see them as yielding to the forces of wokeness and uh, falling apart uh, because they're afraid. And so I'm not going to watch Fox. And if there's no Trumpers watching Fox, it is going to be pretty quiet over there on uh, whatever channel it is. So um, I... I don't know what's going to happen to Fox. I think I think they're in some pretty bad trouble um, because they, they're not welcome in Trump land and they do not have the capacity to make themselves welcome in Biden land. And so they're, I don't know, maybe switch to a different language and go to another country. <laughs> I don't know. My Carl. <laughs> well, I, I, I can sense the... Uh, uh, 
desire to see you know the demise of Fox in both the statements I've I've just heard, and 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 I, and I think it's just wishful thinking. Fox is still part of the Wall Street Journal media uh, enterprise, and it will continue to appeal to the rational, uh, you know, affluent people who uh, have always supported it. And uh, it, I think you're you're just wishful thinking that it's that it's in decline. And believe me, uh, there'll be plenty of uh, continued coverage of of all the things that they've always covered before you know as a regular viewer i always turned it off at eight because that's when tucker carlson came on i didn't need that but i always had it on before that and i daily read the wall street journal page to page page to page well you know not all the the Stock uh, reports, <laughs> but, but but all the editorial part. <laughs> General Dynamics, yes. eleven and a seven eighths. General Motors, twelve and a four. <laughs> I'm on the F's, honey. I'll be back later. All right, uh, Joe Ferretti. Well, the, the the issue with Fox is uh, it was a battle between conservatism and crazy, and and their nighttime broadcasting just went a little crazy, and they're going to pay for it. And they're when you want to know where Fox is going to go, I can tell you one place. That's back to court. Because uh, Symantec has a lawsuit uh, pending over the same, very same issues that Dominion had. So uh, the, the drumbeat's going to continue regarding uh, paying for the uh, sins of the past at Fox. But I, I, there's a development going on that I think is going to work in Fox television's advantage. AM radio is. Uh, and I hate to say this, uh, Mr. Hornby, if you're listening, but AM radio is in trouble. Uh, all the automotive manufacturers are announcing or are going to announce that AM radio is not going to be available in your car any longer. And AM radio, uh, if you ride around this country and you tune into AM radio, it is dominated by conservative talk. There's no question they have the high ground when it comes to that broadcast medium. And if AM radio is not available in automobiles, the, the marketing dollars are going to dry up, and AM radio is going to die up. Now, where are those folks going to go? Well, they're going to go to television and the Internet. And I think Fox News, in the long run, will benefit from that development. So I don't think they're going away, uh, but they will be changing a little bit about their format and hopefully adopting stricter journalistic ethics uh, that will serve us all well. Ford, I think it was Ford, reversed their decision to eliminate AM radio, and Congress has been active about ensuring that that does not happen. It's not a law yet, but they are looking into it. I hadn't, I hadn't even heard yeah. about this movement. What, what's it all about? What's the concept, or what's what's the rationale? Yeah. Well, most young car buyers don't use their radios anyway, period, end of story, and very few of them even know the right. AM band exists. Yeah, but it's all exactly. digital, so why would it matter? I mean, it doesn't doesn't cost the manufacturer anything more to have AM on your digital radio anymore. Well, it, it, so. it must take up some space in, in something. I, was, well, it's, I, I haven't read it. Another, another reason not to buy a new car. <laughs> 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 However, if you do, right. Ken Parsons Ford or Hagerstown <laughs> Ford amongst our many great sponsors, CMA Miller, huh? Yeah. My 25-year-old Toyota <laughs> truck still gets AM radio just fine. As does yeah. my vehicle. It, it started with the EV market, and so evidently there's some interference between uh, the AM and what the EV is doing. I don't understand the technicality, correct. but that's where it started. I don't either, so, Bill. Yeah. Well, let me that's get back correct. to Fox real quick. Mr. Right, Hunt, so, you're up. So here's the thing. It's evident that about half of our country are conservatives. There's nowhere else for a conservative to go to get the conservative viewpoint other than Fox. And there have been big names that have left Fox in the past, like Megyn Kelly and Bill O'Reilly. And Fox has done just fine with replacing them. And I don't see where anything is really going to change because there's still 50% of the country are conservatives and there's only one news outlet to go for them to get their news. This would be a bigger problem if it was on the Democrat side because you have three or four different options and, and they're spreading that 50 percent amongst them, which is why I think Fox leads in in ratings, you know, month after month after month uh, is 
not because they're, they're well I think their ideas are any are better but it's because the other side splits between three or four different media markets back to you bill yeah my sense is they've taken a uh, hit recently but I don't think it's going to be fatal I think they're going to pop right back as Mike Height has suggested so. and Mr. Height you are on the clock now with issue number three all right I'm going to go to the, the presidential uh, campaign again and and my question is do the Republican presidential candidates really believe they can beat Trump or are they hoping like like Larry that Trump's legal issues will take him out and they'll only have to beat each other interesting question Joe let's go back to you I well I'll go back to a comment I made earlier I, I have not been impressed with these other candidates uh, and I'll give you an example uh, beyond the, the uh, ridiculous rollout that Ron DeSantis tried to have on Twitter, uh, Nikki Haley is speaking before a group in New Hampshire. Now, her campaign uh, is, is certainly running on fumes at this point. So she gets up and she starts rail, railing and raving, ranting about Bud Light. Okay, And we all understand what the issue is with Bud Light. It's so tone deaf because five miles down the road from where she was speaking in a diner in New Hampshire is a Bud Light bottling factory manned by the Teamsters. And she's up there talking about Bud Light and the issues associated with that. And it it, it just shows that these folks are not ready for prime time. They don't have the people in place who are sophisticated enough to take on the Trump machine. So I, I am very pessimistic about any of these folks mounting the kind of campaign that's going to take Trump down. Mr. Schultz. They are certainly hoping that they will be in a position to beat the others when Donald Trump gets convicted of a crime that his supporters even will have to concede is serious enough to render him um, useless. I mean, there's... They're starting to reach out for Trump business dealings, I believe, probably related to the Saudis in the Mar-a-Lago investigation. And if they find that he sold classified materials to the Saudis to get his golf courses set up there, he's going to be in bad trouble because that's not just some little failure of politeness. That's like pretty close to treason. And so even even the most uh, diehard Trump supporter, if it appears that Trump has committed a treasonous act, will start to say, okay, maybe we need to reconsider all this. And that's how they hope to get there. I think that explains why they're not classic sort of, you know, long-term senators or governors who have big policy issues. Remember, this is a party that doesn't have a platform. So what else are they going to talk about? (laughs) Yes, we do. (laughs) We we have a rather lengthy platform. Thank you. (laughs) It's online. You can go read it, Larry. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, You know, they never, there's never a discussion of policy. Nikki Haley gets up and talks about cultural issues. Like, we need the President of the United States to rule the culture. I don't think that's what we need. Um, And so they are waiting around to see what happens to Donald Trump. Uh, And then they will vie, if he's still in, they will vie to be his VP, regardless of what criticism they've ever laid on him. Billy, I think they're taking a longer view than just uh, uh, next two or three months. Uh, There are nine individuals that have already declared to run for president on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. And there are seven more in the wing that may or may not. With the exception of maybe two, Hutchison and Mike Pence, all of them that have declared are relatively young individuals. And most of those that are possibly thinking about it, several of those are young individuals as well. I think what they're doing is positioning themselves for 28 and not necessarily for 24. And they can, they can get name recognition. They can uh, get in front of the public. They can start finding dollars that will support them in the subsequent race. Again, they're all young people, including DeSantis. So they could easily set out this race or not make a serious attempt and position themselves four years down the road. Mr. Carl. Well, I, I feel a lot better 
are more favorable to the process, the different uh, Republican uh, candidates who are, you know, announced or send signals that uh, you know, Scott and Haley and DeSantis, uh, I feel are, you know, excellent prospects. I agree with Bill that, you know, they, you know, they're uh, not necessarily rooting for Trump's demise so much as just, you know, setting up future because they're young and, and can, you know, have some time to build build their reputation. So so I I, I feel good about the uh, array of Republican prospects right now and and it certainly contrasts with the array of Democratic prospects. Would you want to beat Trump in a primary if you're a Republican right now? I mean if if he's not the nominee in the primary, then he's going to be some type of alternate party candidate or alternate movement candidate and suck all the wind out of the room anyway. Well if 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 one of these you know, legal proceedings. I didn't. I wasn't aware of the one last one Larry just mentioned about the deal in uh, in the Middle East. But but uh, he if, made it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Larry. No, they issued a subpoena. For okay, the, for the but, financial but, documents. But, Jack Smith's looking close. But if, but if one of those one of those things doesn't take him out, I don't think he he will lose in the primary. And and I would be stunned if he lost in the primary. If if one of these you know, issues and legal proceedings didn't take him out. Yeah, but my opinion on that was that I think whether he wins or loses in the primary, he's still the guy in the primary that's going to take all the news. Well, and and, and part of the problem is timing. And he'll, and he'll torture the nominee if he is not the nominee. Well, we'll see. Through social media and and. Meetings, uh, town halls, whatever he will. If he, if he loses the primary, the you th- you think he would he would uh, try to destroy the Republicans' prospects to win the election? Hundred hundred percent. Yes, I yes, no yes, yes. I, even, yes. even I don't think he's that much of an egomaniac. I, th- I I'm saying, <laughs> even I don't think he's that. I mean, if if now. Inherently, there would be arguments and you know about cheating and election stealing and everything that would you know might crop up and if that if that <laughs> turns that way, so you know that, I, I wouldn't say that is not a possibility. But if if it's clear that and and how that could happen, I'm not sure. When is you, you know how someone could so clearly win the you know uh, the primary uh, and beat him that uh, it would. Uh, uh, you know, have, Mike, take out. Have you ever seen one example where he's lost on an issue and just casually stepped aside? Uh, no, I have not either. <laughs> okay, yeah. but 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 at the same time, uh, it, it really depends on how it happens and why it happens. And and uh, but again, uh, if one of these legal cases takes him out, uh, then you know then. That's a whole new world. Well, why do you think he would be loyal to the Republican Party? What, what what do you think is his career loyalty to the party? It's not like this is a guy who registered as a Republican when he was 18, has voted in every election for Republicans since then, and has only contributed to Republican candidates. Because, because I think he is smart enough to know that if he fought the Republican nominee and thereby you know enabled the election of a democrat that his he even he would recognize that his reputation would be lost mike he sabotaged the georgia primary the georgia runoff by telling the republicans stay home your vote doesn't matter it's a corrupt election anyway and two democrats in georgia won the runoff election and then tipped the power of the senate to the Democrats so that Biden had a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and himself in the White House for the first two years. He did that. And, and, and Was that out of loyalty to the Republican Party by telling people to stay home? I think he's smart enough to see what a mistake that was and not do it again. I don't think so at all. I think he, <laughs> all right. I think, I think that's set up as, let Biden and them have power for two years, then the country will see that I was right all along and they're going to want me back. I think that was self Well, and, and the midterms didn't really... Uh, they didn't back him up. Sustain that, right? No, they didn't. I, I think his arrogance gets in the way of his intelligence. Oh, I, I, there's no question about that. There's no question about that. But at some point, even and and you know the the 
Republican successors will be smart enough to embrace Donald Trump and give him all the superficial lauding that will keep him from doing that. Mr. Hyde, it comes back to you. Has Joe, has Joe for ready? Yeah, Joe, Joe let off. Joe, if you'd like to chime in again, you're welcome to. Oh, I, just one real quick comment, because Mike Hyde said something really important about how his Trump's arrogance uh, overcomes his intelligence. <laughs> Mike, that's not a high bar to Mike, I haven't seen a whole lot of intelligence in either one of the front runners. So <laughs> I would put Trump's intelligence up against um, Biden's any day. I, I, I would too, <laughs> especially now. Yeah. I, I do think some of these these secondary people, the DeSantis's um, of the Republican Party, are waiting for his legal troubles to catch up to him, and and. I think that's one of the reasons they're not attacking him early, um, because they're going to need those Trumpers to vote for them in the long term if the legal troubles uh, take him out of the race. Well, let, let's put, uh, be clear on that. The legal troubles would take him out of the race at the ballot box, not with his cap- ability to, I mean, the eligibility to serve as, as president. Oh, he could true. be serving as president even from a jail cell. This, ca- this, this, this case that... Larry talked about would take him out as president and through an uh, if, if they if, find that if, he took documents, yes. sold them to the yeah. Saudis yeah. to get the Saudis to put the live golf tournaments but, on his courses. It would make him in I, I, over. I, no, hold a second. Why? Why? I think the Constitution does not address that issue. The ballot box does address it. He would not be elected. But the word, but I think, tre- the word treason. Yes. Certainly, even in the case yeah, of Donald it, Trump, I, I, no, no, I, I think but, the uh, Supreme Court, just like they did the other day, would vote nine zero. But does the Constitution that, 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 that that's right when it talks about the qualifications to be president? It's very limited on what the what would eliminate you, and the word treason does not appear. I, I agree, but even it's going to be hard, even for the most diehard Trumper to but say that's what I'm he's talking about. been adjudged a traitor to this nation. He sold our secrets for cash. But my if po- that's true, then I think that'll move even those folks. No, I don't think it will. Hold a second. Say, okay. what, I, think they'll say, I think they'll say Biden did it in yeah. Ukraine and got away with it with his son, so why can't Trump do it? I'm, but my point is there's a lot of things that could keep him from being elected president in the ballot from the ballot box, the electors, but there's nothing in the Constitution that would prevent him from continuing to run, from continuing to run and actually being elected. I, I, I'm not... I, you, you, it's, it's, it's a blank issue. I mean, I agree there's no affirmative prohibition against a convicted criminal from running and serving as president but but i i i think uh, uh, ultimate interpretation that because it so undermines the authority of the president to be subject to you know to a criminal violation and and, and be in prison <laughs> that 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 i think the supreme court would find that that's an implied prohibition not if it follow the constitution mike they, what is the Constitution is what the Supreme Court says. <laughs> yeah, as as millions of American women found out. Um, and yeah. on that note, <laughs> on Stevie Nicks' 75th birthday, we'll with Max to take into the break here at uh, 9.31. Today, Mike, your mother has the comment of the day on Facebook. By the way, we're at 91. We need nine more comments to get to 100 and triple digits mm-hmm. for the day today. Your Bring mother, it, guys. Your mother asks the question, if you are elected president while you are in jail, can you pardon yourself? <laughs> Bill says yes. I say no. Yeah. I, I'd like to see the arguments at the Supreme Court for that, whether or not you can. That would be an interesting debate. A, as you remember, uh, toward the tail end of uh, of Trump being in office, there's a lot of discussion. Could he pardon himself for future crimes? The answer to that future. is no. That's got to be no. Yeah, yeah that's no. a no. Yeah. I still think it's no, too. Joe, you're an attorney. Larry, you're an attorney. Mike, you're an attorney. What's your legal opinion on this? Freddie, you go first. No. Larry? Yeah, no. I think, and it can't be your hoping. No, no I, th- I think no, <laughs> no, no. You just can't. My Carl, I'll make it unanimous. No, three no's. Bill, you're on I the outside still, looking in yeah, here. I still am, and probably the only lawyer that uh, besides Mike, and we can see things clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Nash, right there. Johnny Nash. Larry Schultz, you're on the clock. Yes, uh, Elmer Stewart Rhodes, the uh, 
my term for him is the pirate of democracy, draws 18 years in federal prison. My question is, is that fair? Is that fair? Is everybody familiar with this case? He was the leader of the Oath Keepers who largely led the insurrection and the attack on the Capitol. But was not present, was he? He was not. No. Was not, as I recall. Here's a, law, a school law, mate, a law classmate of who? Uh, he was, yeah, I don't know that he was a classmate of Clarence Thomas and Mike Carl, but he certainly went to the same school. <laughs> I, I, I checked, and he must have been with the Clintons. <laughs> he, he wasn't in our class. <laughs> Before and after. Uh, all right, Joe Ferretti, is that a fair sentence? Well, the, the, the charge was, and remember, this was a thing that's very difficult to prove, but seditious conspiracy. And... They had a treasure trove of emails and cell phone communications about the organization of what happened on January 6th in the days leading up, days and actually months. And there was also this concern about a cache of weapons that were being held in a hotel room outside of the District of Columbia that were available and accessible to those who thought it good to storm the Capitol and run roughshod over our Capitol Police and and, and try to disrupt our proceedings. Uh, So uh, the the judge took it seriously. And one of the things, and and I'm sure Larry and Mike will agree with this, one of the things about our criminal and civil justice system is that the setting a precedent is so important. It is signaling to society what will and will not be sanctioned or tolerated by an organized society. And in this case, I'm sure the judge had it in the back of his mind, if I was to guess, the rationale for this severe sentence was to send a signal to those others out there, and there are many, as we get warned all the time by the FBI and our intelligence agencies and Homeland Security about the domestic threats that exist in this country. It was vitally important to send a signal that if you do something along the lines of this, where you are attacking elected officials and threatening them with their very lives, that there's going to be a penalty to pay and it's going to be severe. So I think that's what was behind the sentence, and I think it is altogether fair. Michael Height. So was it fair? I would say yes, it was fair. But we have to remember that our country was founded on sedition. Um, that that's what we did. We we moved against the current government at the time. So the only difference is if you're successful, you're a patriot, and if you're not, you're you're a criminal. And in this particular case, what he was doing was found criminal. I don't have a problem with it. 18 years, that's fine. I don't think that you're going to find a whole lot of Republicans that are going to come to his defense. Michael, well, uh, I I wouldn't be one of them. In fact, I've I've strongly support the the uh, sentencing and uh but but i wouldn't use the rationale that mike just used about well you know it it could have turned out to be a you know a great new country you know? <laughs> no, i didn't say that <laughs> the word, that's what words in my mouth <laughs> no, no, that's what i heard too mike i was wondering if i was the only one yeah i mean no, 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 no. The, 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 this country was founded on sedition against it you know well, the, it was. the british government but I'm talking about the substantive quality and greatness of the American country. It was under attack, and so I think the sentence was correct. Can we go back to Height advocating for an overthrow of the government? <laughs> no. <laughs> Delegate Michael Height today advocated for the overthrow of the United that States. That did not happen. <clears throat> Mr. Stubblefield. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, he, everybody says he got a severe penalty. He did get a severe penalty, 18 years, uh, but he could have gotten more. Uh, I think 25 years is what the prosecutors are asking for. Uh his his deputy or number two man in the uh, in the organization was also convicted on the same charge, celestial uh, conspiracy. Uh, he got I think eleven or twelve years, uh, a few years less than what uh, Rhodes did. The difference is that the deputy demonstrated or displayed remorse for what he did. Rhodes did not. Rhodes went in at the very end, was defiant, and uh, and. Uh, and showed his defiance uh and that's why the judge 
without display of remorse gave him a, a, a more severe penalty than his deputy. I think, well, I'll be on record with everybody else, I think it was most appropriate. Back to you, uh, Larry. Uh, yes, we should keep in mind that there are still people in this country who've done more than 18 years in jail for selling marijuana, nonviolent sale of marijuana. So it's certainly a reasonable thing. It's the highest sentence that anybody's gotten out of this, but I think it is a, certainly a reasonable punishment uh, for this. Um, it will be interesting to see, then no doubt will be an appeal and an attempt to um, you know, lessen the sentence or uh, even uh, um, acquit him altogether. Um, and that's how our system works. I'm perfectly prepared to watch that uh, go through. Uh, but th this is very important um, material because this wasn't peaceful. It was violent. And it was, I mean, you know, ask Mike Pence how, how he felt that day. He was, uh, he was being chanted, uh, you know, to be hung by the people out front. And so I bet Mike Pence is kind of happy with this. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to know. By the way, when we talk about whether any Republicans support him, Donald Trump is on record just the other day as saying that he would uh, pardon uh, many, if not all, of the um, of the people convicted uh, in that thing. So there are some folks who think that it's uh, unfair and think that uh, maybe it should do it. And one of them, I think, is running for president. Now, whether in the case of Stuart Rhodes he would do it, uh, who knows? Uh, he's left himself a little bit of uh, running room there. But uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Donald Trump as president in 2025 commute his sentence or pardon him. I wouldn't. Issue number five, we go to Mike Carl. This is uh, my favorite area. You're not going to ask if Biden is the worst president in the country? <laughs> no, no, no. I, uh, we've, we've covered that. <laughs> that that's settled. <laughs> so, uh, settled law. It, 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 is it ignorance or real intellectual dishonesty that motivates the Democrats to claim that the 2017 tax rate cuts uh, contributed to uh, a loss of revenues? That is absolute. It, it is a lie, and the only defense of the Democrats who argue it is that they don't know any better. What is your evidence that it is? It is a fact? The, the, the proof is overwhelming. The, what, the, the, what, did you bring any math with you? The 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 the, the, the revenues went up in in the, the year following the the effect of the tax cuts, and they continued to go up. The revenues went up from the tax system. And that is because you lower the rates, you raise the revenue, you raise, you stimulate the economy. And they don't want to acknowledge that. In fact, in their you know, budget talks, you know, they want to raise taxes again, which will just reduce revenues. So my question is, uh, which was it, just ignorance or were they actively lying? All right, so I don't have any... Don't those, have any are, those are your only two choices. I don't have any active... <laughs> <laughs> it's like it might limit the discussion, but okay. Um, I don't have any numbers in front of me that show what Mike is saying is, is factual, but we're going to go on your, your words as a tax accountant, I'll, I'll, a tax lawyer. I'll, I'm follow, sorry. I'll follow up with uh, objective uh, data that proves we'll, it. We'll, we'll accept it as, as fact for the moment. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, revenues went up. Thank you. But that's not the end of the analysis. There was inflation at the time, and there was growth, inherited growth coming from the Obama administration that also grew revenues, okay? Because other people whose tax rate was unaffected were continuing to pay the same rates. Uh, it did go up a little. What usually goes on here is they tell us, well, those tax cuts paid for themselves. No, they didn't. That is very conclusively shown. But it's it, not shown. It's it a is. it's an absolute lie. They Mike, did Mike, not pay. Let, let, I'm sorry. Let the man I'm sorry, finish. I'm sorry. <laughs> they did not. Out of order. <laughs> let the man finish. <laughs> this there's is an Al Pacino schools, and Justice for All here. There's two schools of economists, b both groups very well respected, who have analyzed this question. You can Google it. 
It was the 2017 tax rate. Did they uh, tax cuts? Did they pay for themselves? Uh, did they stimulate the economy? Two very clear schools of PhD economists from why schools as good as Yale and Harvard uh, who have said, uh, I disagree. And so it's not an absolute certainty. Um, and there is a some pretty good evidence that other factors played a role in the increase in those revenues. I've noticed that the more Larry wants to antagonize, the higher the pitch of his voice goes when he gives those facts. <laughs> pretty soon it's going to be Mariah Carey knocking out a few notes up there. <laughs> My guide. Um, so I'll go to the first, the, the Obama growth, which was an anemic at best. Um, even it would, There was growth, but whew, barely growth. It wasn't until the tax cuts of 2017 that we saw real growth. And that real growth didn't have any inflationary issues at the time. The inflation didn't come until the Biden administration. So We had inflation uh, back then, too. Uh, not not to the degree we have it now. It was right. Uh, again, but you're it was talking about a tiny increase. It was in still revenues. mild, very very yeah. mild. So I, you know, I would say that it's just an outright lie to answer your question. But they have to. I mean, if you're that side, you have to spin it that way, or or else you can't impose or you can't take back those tax cuts and impose the the economy that you want with it that we have now which is a disaster um so uh, to your answer your question it was an outright lie okay. joe although larry was well, say larry's arguments were saying that maybe they don't know any better <laughs> well, <laughs> Go I, I, I mean to be I, you know I, I, be nice about it <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Uh, Mike, I don't, I don't understand this uh, idea that the economy currently is a disaster. I think it's remarkably resilient in the face of inflationary pressures and, and the uh, Fed raising rates to uh, uh, over 6%. Um, it, we have unemployment at the highest levels. We've, uh, we have employment at the highest levels we've ever seen. Uh, so I, I, I think the economy is pretty strong. In fact, surprisingly strong. But... Overall, in spite I, of this administration. Well, I, yeah, that's I understand your viewpoint. Uh, but Mike Carl, <laughs> look, I, I, Mike, I'm going to Mike Carl, I'm going to concede you. You have probably forgotten more about tax policy than I'll ever know. But what I can't get around is the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan group that we always run to to score legislation to see what the impact is going to be on the debt and the deficit. They are saying that extending the Trump tax cuts would add $3.5 trillion to our deficit in the next 10 years. And they have said in a, a Senate Budget Committee meeting just a week ago that the Bush and Trump tax cuts are the largest driver of deficits and account for 57 percent of the debt to GDP ratio since 2001. So I don't understand how you can square your uh, contesting this by saying that we add revenues when we cut taxes, yet it seems to be from nonpartisan groups that there is a deleterious effect of cutting these taxes in terms of our deficit and debt. If, if you think the Congressional Budget Office is nonpartisan and doesn't, uh, you know, is objective, then uh, we've got a different uh, view of the Congressional Budget Office. I mean, isn't that who we run to in terms of uh, trying to? That's, that's, who, that's, who the, that's who the media and the Democrats run to. It's not who I run to. I run to the actual Whoa. data, which I will uh, send to Rob and copy everybody else. Uh, data, data published by Rupert Murdoch in the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, <laughs> which is a thousand times more objective than the Congressional Budget Office. Get but, back to me when the Budget Office gets sued. For lying about people, but the also when you're, but this is when this you're is where we are the, in any conversation, though, and that <laughs> is that if, if you display math, it's well, who did the math? Because they're not reliable. My guy's math is better than your guy's math. So we're we're in, in a situation the, the in math. America where we can't have a debate about anything because nobody's facts but, are trusted. But the congressional, what 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 uh, uh, Joe's talking about is a projection by mm -hmm. these people. CBO projections, yes, and 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 that is. 
tainted by philosophy and point of view. It is not reality. And, when, and, and believe me, if if they if they take back and raise taxes, our deficit will get worse because our revenues will plummet. Well, tax tax increases or tax decreases, I should say, don't inherently cause a deficit. It's the spending side of things that inherently cause Thank a deficit. You. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. But, That's but the it, point. But there are expenses that do need to be covered. The problem with the tax cuts that have been passed is there haven't been corresponding spending cuts that have gone along with that. So if you pass a tax cut, you have to responsibly also pass a spending cut that goes with it. And Republicans have not done that successfully with any of the tax cuts that they have enacted since Ronald Reagan first passed tax cuts and, and began eliminating some spending on some tax. I, I, I don't disagree with Thank that, you. that point yep. at all. But the, the simple fact of, raise, of lowering the tax rates raises tax revenues in a market economy. And the, spe the spending on the other side is a totally separate problem, and it is the problem. Some, well, sometimes well, it's it not a totally separate problem. Sometimes the very same companies that are getting the tax cuts are getting massive subsidies from the federal government. And so Many when times. we cut those taxes, those are the focus cuts in spending we need to make. In other words, if they're not going to pay in, they're not going to get free money oh, from the government. Nobody's they're arguing. getting it now. Well, and, and how many times do we say we just want the federal government out of our hair? And then we take the subsidy that they give us with the next hand that's out, right? Yep. So, subsidies are, are a manipulation of the free enterprise they system. Are. And therefore, they should be very carefully dealt with. But we can't keep passing tax cuts if we don't cut spending. Uh, agreed. Absolutely agreed. And the problem with cutting spending is there just aren't a lot of... There's not a lot of room. We covered this last week a bit in the discretionary budget, budget for cutting spending because... Some of the things that are mandatory, like Social Security and Medicare, are you going to start cutting that? And if, if you don't, then what's left <laughs> yeah, is a yeah, real small fraction that doesn't cover the deficit. There is all kinds of discretionary spending that's wasteful. Okay, but even if you eliminated all that, that doesn't cover the deficit. Oh, it would, absolutely. If we go through the list, what, what I consider wasteful is probably broader than what you would. Well, you might maybe you cut out two billion dollars in wasteful spending on this, and ten billion on that, and another billion there. It still doesn't add up to a trillion. No, well, that, there's yeah, there, and we're over a trillion there, there, in, in deficit. But 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 a lot of the the you know particularly incredibly lying la label lied uh, thing about the Inflation Reduction Act did just the re reverse and and. Uh, S Senator Manchin got fooled into sport, and now he's you know he's seen the light. Let's hope. I think I think his polling numbers help yeah. him see the light. <laughs> yeah, Bill. Yeah, thank you, Rob. I've been making taking notes here uh, for rebuttal in all cases, and I didn't think I was going to be able to use my notes, but I I have I have a couple seconds. The floor is yours, Senator. <laughs> okay, uh, Mike, you're talking about the uh, the Obama um, uh, years. If you looked at the 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 trend, the economic trend, uh, he inherited the Bush recession, and we're deep in the hole. By 2013, 2014, we're already coming out of it. And it's hard to isolate any particular administration of all success and failures because they depend so much on the previous administration. So I think the Obama policy was much uh, was more positive than what you said, Fit. Going back to um, uh, the, the Trump era, uh, either way you want to cut it, uh, everybody, I think, recognized everybody, at least most of what I've read, uh, uh, the uh, Trump administration contributed eight billion dollars eight trillion dollars eight trillion dollars to our federal deficit uh now was it because of lack of discipline on the spending side or the tax cut you can argue this all the day all long day long if you want to but the bottom line was eight trillion dollars was contributed to, to, uh, growth contributed during the trump administration uh there was the the bottom line is uh was resources uh, matched our expenditure, uh, and 
I'm not sure anybody believes that. If you look at, I mean, knows that. If you look at the uh, uh, the Heritage Foundation, they would pick up on Mike's point. If you look at other organizations, it's just the opposite. R time will tell, but right now it's very confusing what actually caused this $8 trillion increase in our deficit. I don't know. Well, uh, final thought goes back to you, Mike Carl. Well, I, I agree generally that, that the government spent too much money, you know, and which is you know, under Trump's leadership uh, generally. But some of that was necessary to restore our national security, which had been undermined in the previous administration. So, uh, so let, let's, let's, let's uh, yeah. uh, get, get your final thoughts together. Bill, you can't, don't have time to get that one out because we need to get into the break here. You get eight seconds apiece on the other side of these.